of man's first disobedience in the fruit of that forbidden tree, whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe, with loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed, in the beginning how the heavens and the earth rose out of chaos, or, if Sion Hill delight thee more, in Silua's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song, that, with no middle flight, intends to soar above the Aeonian mount, while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme, and chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost prefer, before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me, for thou knowest, thou from the first was present, and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like, satst brooding on the vast abyss, and made it pregnant. What in me is dark, illumine, what is low, raise and support, that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence, and justify the ways of God to men. Say first, for heaven hides nothing from thy view, nor the deep tract of hell. Say first, what cause moved our grandparents in that happy state, favored of heaven so highly, to fall off from their Creator, and transgress his will, for one restraint, lords of the world besides, who first seduced them to that foul revolt, the infernal serpent, he it was whose guile, stirred up with envy and revenge, deceived the mother of mankind, what time his pride had cast him out from heaven, with all his host of rebel angels, by whose aid, aspiring to set himself in glory above his peers, he trusted to have equaled the Most High, if he opposed, and, with ambitious aim, against the throne and monarchy of God, raised in pious war in heaven, and battled proud, with vain attempt, him the almighty power, hurled headlong, flaming from the ethereal sky, with hideous ruin and combustion, down to bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fires, who durst defy the omnipotent to arms, nine times the space that measures day and night. To mortal men he with his horrid crew lay vanquished, rolling in the fiery gulf, confounded, though immortal. But his doom reserved him to more wrath, for now the thought, both of lost happiness and lasting pain, torments him. Round he throws his baleful eyes, that witnessed huge affliction and dismay, mixed with obdurate pride and steadfast hate. At once, as far as angels can, he views the dismal situation waste and wild, a dungeon horrible on all sides round, as one great furnace flamed. Yet from those flames no light, but rather darkness visible, served only to discover sights of woe, regions of sorrow, doleful shades, where peace and rest can never dwell, Hope never comes, that comes to all, but torture without end still urges, and a fiery deluge, fed, with ever-burning sulphur and consumed. Such place eternal justice had prepared for those rebellious, here their prison ordained, in utter darkness, and their portion set, as far removed from God and light of heaven, as from the centre thrice to the utmost pole. Oh, how unlike the place from whence they fell! There the companions of his fall, o'erwhelmed with floods and whirlwind, and weltering by his side, one next himself in power, and next in crime, long after known in Palestine, and named Beelzebub, to whom the archenemy, and thence in heaven called Satan, with bold words, breaking the horrid silence, thus began. If thou beest he, but oh, how fallen, how changed, from him who, in the happy realms of light, clothed with transcendent brightness, did outshine, myriads, thou bright, if he who mutual league, united thoughts and counsels, equal hope, and hazard in the glorious enterprise, joined with me, once, now, misery hath joined, an equal ruin, into that pit thou seest, from what height fallen, so much the stronger proved, he with his thunder, and till then who knew, the force of those dire arms, yet not for those, nor what the potent victor in his rage, can else inflict, do I repent or change, though changed in outward luster, that fixed mind, and high disdain from sense of injured merit, that with the mightiest raised me to contend, and the fierce to contention brought along, innumerable force of spirits armed, that durst dislike his reign, and, me preferring, his utmost power with averse power opposed, in dubious battle on the plains of heaven, 
and shook his throne, what though the field be lost. All is not lost, the unconquerable will, and study of revenge, immortal hate, and courage never to submit or yield, and what else not to be overcome, that glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me, to bow and sue for grace, with suppliant knee, defy his power, who from the terror of his arm so late, doubted his empire, that were low indeed, that were an ignominy, and shame beneath this downfall, since, by fate, the strength of gods, and this imperial substance, cannot fail, since, through experience of this great event, in arms not worst, in foresight much advanced, we may with more successful hope resolve to wage, by force or guile, eternal war, irreconcilable to our grand foe, who now triumphs, and, in the excess of joy, soul reigning, holds the tyranny of heaven. So spake the apostate angel, though in pain, vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair, and him thus answered soon his bold compeer, O prince, O chief of many throne powers, that led the embattled seraphim to war, under thy conduct and in dreadful deed, fearless endangered heaven's perpetual king, and put to proof his high supremacy, whether upheld by strength or chance or fate, too well I see in rue the dire event, that with sad overthrow and foul defeat, hath lost us heaven, and all this mighty host in horrible destruction laid thus low, as far as gods and heavenly essences can perish, for the mind and spirit remain invincible, and vigor soon returns, though all our glory extinct in happy state, here swallowed up in endless misery. But what if he, our conqueror, whom I now of force believe almighty, since no less than such could have overpowered such force as ours, have left us this our spirit and strength entire, strongly to suffer and support our pains, that we may so suffice his vengeful ire, or do him mightier service as his thralls by right of war, whate'er his business be, here in the heart of hell to work in fire, or to his errands in the gloomy deep? What can it then avail, though yet we feel strength undiminished or eternal being, to undergo eternal punishment? Whereto, with speedy words, the archfiend replied, Fallen cherub, to be weak is miserable, doing or suffering, but of this be sure, to do aught good never will be our task, but ever to do ill our sole delight, as being the contrary to his high will, whom we resist. If then his providence out of our evil seek to bring forth good, our labor must be to prevent that end, and out of good still to find means of evil, which oft times may succeed, so as perhaps shall grieve him. If I fail not, and disturb his inmost counsels from their destined aim, but see, the angry victor hath recalled his ministers of vengeance and pursuit back to the gates of heaven. The sulphurous hail, shot after us in storms o'erblown, hath laid the fiery surge that from the precipice of heaven received us falling, and the thunder, winged with red lightning and impetuous rage, perhaps hath spent his shafts, and ceases now to bellow through the vast and boundless deep. Let us not slip the occasion, whether scorn or satiate fury, yield it from our foe. Seest thou the dreary plain, forlorn and wild, the seat of desolation, void of light, save what the glimmering of these livid flames cast pale and dreadful? Thither let us tend, from off the tossing of these fiery waves, their rest, if any rest can harbor there, and, reassembling our affected powers, consult how we may henceforth most offend our enemy, our own loss how repair, how overcome this dire calamity, what reinforce we may gain from hope, if not, what resolution from despair. Thus Satan, talking to his nearest mate, with head uplift above the wave, and eyes that sparkling blazed, his other parts besides, prone on the flood, extended long and large, lay floating many a rood, in bulk as huge as whom the fables named of monstrous size, Titanian, or earth-born, that warred on Jove, Briareus of Typhon, whom the den by ancient Tarsus held, or that sea-beast Leviathan, which god of all his works created hugest that swims the ocean stream, him haply slumbering on the Norway foam, the pilot of some small night-foundered skiff, deeming some island, oft as seamen tell, with fixed anchor on his scaly rind, moors by his side under the lee, while night invests the sea and wish-morn delays, so stretched out huge in length the archfiend lay, 
chained in the burning lake, nor ever thence had risen or heaved his head, but that the will and high permission of all ruling heaven left him at large to his own dark designs, that with reiterated crimes he might heap on himself damnation while he sought evil to others, and, enraged, might see how all his malice served but to bring forth infinite goodness, grace, and mercy, shown on man by him seduced, but on himself treble confusion, wrath, and vengeance poured. Forthwith upright he rears off the pool his mighty stature, on each hand the flames, driven backward, slope their pointing spires, and, rolled in billows, leave on the midst of a horrid veil. Then with expanded wing he steers his flight, aloft incumbent on the dusky air, that felt unusual weight till on dry land he lights, if it were land that ever burned, with solid, as the lake with liquid, fire, and thus appeared in hue as when the force of subterranean winds transport a hill torn from Pelorus, or the shattered side of thundering Aetna, whose combustible and fueled entrails, thence conceiving fire, sublimed with mineral fury, aid the winds, and leave a single bottom all involved with stench and smoke, such resting found the soul of unblessed feet. Him followed his next mate, both glorying to have escaped the Stygian flood, as gods, and by their own recovered strength, not by the sufferance of supernal power. Is this the region, this the soil, the clime, said then the lost archangel, this the seat, that we must change for heaven, this mournful gloom for that celestial light? Be it so, since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right, furthest from him is best, whom reason hath equalled, force hath made supreme, above his equals, farewell happy fields, where joy forever dwells, hail horrors, hail infernal world, and thou profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time, the mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. What matter where, if I be still the same, in what I should be, all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater, here at least we shall be free, the Almighty hath not built here for his envy, will not drive us hence, here we may secure, and, in my choice, to reign is worth ambition, though in hell, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. But wherefore let we then our faithful friends, the associates and co-partners of our loss, lie thus astonished on the oblivious pool, and call them not to share with us their part in this unhappy mansion, or once more with rallied arms to try what may be yet regained in heaven, or what more lost in hell. So Satan spake, and him Beelzebub thus answered, Leader of these armies bright, which but the omnipotent nun could have foiled, if once they hear that voice, their liveliest pledge of hope and fears and dangers, heard so oft in worse extremes, and on the perilous edge, of battle, when it raged in all assaults, their surest signals that they will soon resume, new courage and revive, though now they lie, groveling and prostrate on yon lake of fire, as we erewhile, astounded and amazed, no wonder, fallen such a pernicious height. He scarce had ceased when the superior fiend was moving toward the shore, his ponderous shield, ethereal temper, massy, large and round, behind him cast, the broad circumference hung on his shoulders like the moon, whose orb through optic glass the Tuscan artist views, at evening from the top of Fessel, or in Valdarno, to descry new lands, rivers, or mountains in her spotty globe, his spear to equal which the tallest pine, hewn on Norwegian hills to be the mast, on some great amiral, were but a wand. He walked with support, uneasy steps, over the burning marl, not like those steps on heaven's azure, and the torrid climb, smote on him sore besides, vaulted with fire, Nathless he so endured, till on the beach of that inflamed sea he stood, and called his legions angel forms, who lay entranced, thick as autumnal leaves that strew the brooks in Valambrosia, where the Etrurian shades, high overarched in power, or scattered sedge afloat, when with fierce winds Orion armed, hath vexed the Red Sea coast, whose waves o'er through Bacyrus and his Memphian chivalry, while with perfidious hatred, they pursued the sojourners of Goshen, who beheld from the safe shore their floating carcasses, and broke chariot wheels so thick bestrewn. Abject and lost lay these, covering the flood, under amazement of their hideous changes. 
he called so loud that all the hollow deep of hell resounded. Princes, potentates, warriors, the flower of heaven, once yours, now lost, if such astonishment as this can seize eternal spirits, or have ye chosen this place after the toil of battle to repose your wearied virtue, for the ease you find to slumber here, as in the vales of heaven, or in this abject posture have ye sworn to adore the conqueror, who now beholds cherub and seraph rolling in the flood, with scattered arms and ensigns, till anon his swift pursuers from the heaven gates discern the advantage in descending, tread us down, thus drooping, or with linked thunderbolts transfix us to the bottom of this gulf. Awake, arise, or be forever fallen. They heard, and were abashed, and up they sprung upon the wing, as when men, wont to watch on duty, sleeping, found by whom they dread, rouse and bestir themselves ere well awake, nor did they not perceive the evil plight on which they were, or the fierce pains not feel, yet to their general's voice they soon obeyed, innumerable, as when the potent rod of Amron's son in Egypt's evil day waved round the coast, up called a pitchy cloud of locusts warping on the eastern wind, that o'er the realm of impious Pharaoh hung, like night and darkened all the land of Nile. So numberless were those bad angels seen, hovering on wing under the cope of hell, twixt upper nether and surrounding fires, till at a signal given the uplifting spear of their great sultan waving to direct, their course in even balance down they light on the firm brimstone and fill all the plain, a multitude like which the populous north poured never from her frozen loins to pass Rhine or the Dana, when her barbarous sons came like a deluge on the south and spread beneath Gibraltar to the Libyan sands. Forthwith from every squadron in each band, the heads and leaders that there hast there stood, their great commander, godlike shapes and forms, excelling humans, princely dignities, and powers that erst in heaven sat on thrones. Though of their names in heavenly records now be no memorial, blotted out and raised by their rebellion from the book of life, nor had they yet among the sons of Eve got them new names, till, wandering o'er the earth, through God's high sufferance, for the trial of man, by falsities and lies the greater part of mankind they corrupted to forsake, God their creator, and the invisible glory of him, that made them to transform off to the image of a brute, adorned with gay religions, full of pomp and gold, and devils to adore for deities. Then were they known to men by various names, and various idols through the heathen world. Say, muse, their names, then know, who first, who last, roused from the slumber on that fiery couch. At their great emperor's call, as next in worth, came singly where he stood on the bare strand, while the promiscuous crowd stood yet aloft, the chief were those who, from the pit of hell, roaming to seek their prey on earth, durst fix their seats long after next the seat of God, their altars by his altar, gods adored among the nations round, and durst abide Jehovah thundering out of Sion, throned between the cherubim, yea, often placed within his sanctuary, itself their shrines, abominations and with cursed things, his holy rites and solemn feasts profaned, and with their darkness durst affront his light, first Moloch, horrid king, besmeared with blood of human sacrifice and parents' tears, though, for the noise of drums and timbrels loud, the children's cries unheard they pass through fire to his grim idol, him the Ammonite, worshipped in Raba and her watery plain, in Argob and in Basan, to the stream of utmost Arnon, nor content with such audacious neighborhood, the wisest heart of Solomon he led by fraud to build his temple right against the temple of God, on that opprobrious hill, and made his grove, the pleasant valley of Hinnom, Tophet thence, and black Gehenna called, the type of hell. Next, Camos, the obscene dread of Moab's son, from Aurora to Nebo, and the wild of southmost Abarim, in Hesabon and Horonaim, Seans realms, beyond the flowery dale of Sibma, clad with vines, and Eleo to the asphaltic pool, Peor his other name, when he enticed Israel and Sittim on their march from the Nile, to do him wanton rites which cost them woe, yet thence his luster orgies he enlarged, even to the hill that scandal by the grove of Moloch homicide, lust hard by hate, till good Josiah drove them hence to hell. With these came they, 
who from their bordering flood of old Euphrates to the brook that parts, Egypt from Syrian ground had general names of Balaam and Ashtoreth, those male, those feminine, for spirits, when they please, can either sex assume, or both, so soft and uncompounded is their essence pure, not tied or manacled with joint or limb, nor founded on the brittle strength of bones, like cumbrous flesh, but, in what shape they choose, dilated or condensed, bright or obscure, can execute their airy purpose, and works of love or enmity fulfill, for those the race of Israel oft forsook, their living strength, and unfrequented left his righteous altar, bowing low down to bestial gods, for which their heads so low bowed down in battle, sunk before the spear of despicable foes. With these in troop came Astareth, whom the Phoenicians called Astarte, queen of heaven with crescent horns, to whose bright image nightly by the moon Sidonian virgins paid their vows and songs. In Sion also, not unsung, where stood her temple on the offensive mountain, built by that exorious king, whose heart, though large, beguiled by fair idolatresses, fell to idols foul. Thamuz came next behind, whose annual wound to Lebanon allured the Syrian damsels to lament his fate in amorous ditties all the summer day. While smooth Adonis, from his native rock, ran purple to the sea, suppose with blood of Thamuz yearly wounded, the love-tale infected Sion's daughters with like heat, whose wanton passions in the sacred porch Ezekiel saw when, by the vision led, his eye surveyed the dark idolatries of alienated Judah. Next came one who mourned in earnest, when the captive ark maimed his brute image, heads and hands lopped off in his own temple on the Grunsel edge, where he fell flat and shamed his worshippers, Dagon his name, sea monster, upward man, and downward fish, yet had his temple high, reared in Azotus, dreaded through the coast of Palestine, in Gath and Ascalon, and Acheron, and Gaza's frontier bounds, him followed Rimon, whose delightful seat was fair Damascus, on the fertile banks of Abana, and far, far, lucid streams he also gains, the house of God was bold, a leper once he lost, and gained a king, Ahaz his Scottish conqueror, whom he drew God's altar to disparage and displace, for one of Syrian mode, whereon to burn his odious offerings and adore the gods, whom he had vanquished. After these appeared a crew who, under names of old renown, Osiris, Isis, Horus, and their train, with monstrous shapes and sorceries abused, fanatic Egypt and her priests to seek, their wandering gods disguised in brutish forms rather than human. Nor did Israel escape the infection, when their borrowed gold composed the calf of Oreb, and the rebel king doubled that sin in Bethel and in Dan, likening his maker to the grazed ox, Jehovah who, in one night, when he passed from Egypt, marching, equaled with one stroke both her firstborn and all her bleating gods. Belial came last, than whom a spirit more lewd fell not from heaven, or more gross to love vice for itself. To him no temple stood, or altar smoked, yet who more often heed in temples and at altars, when the priest turns atheist, as did Eli's son, who filled with lust and violence the house of God, in courts and palaces he also reigns, and in luxurious cities where the noise of riots ascend above their loftiest towers, an injury and outrage, and when night darkens the streets, then wander forth the sons of Belial, flown with insolence and wine, witness the streets of Sodom, and that night in Gibeah, when the hospitable door exposed a matron to avoid worse rape. These were the prime in order, and in might, the rest were long to tell, though far renowned. The Ionian gods of Javan's issue held gods, yet confessed later than heaven and earth, their boasted parents, Titans, heaven's firstborn, with his enormous brood and birthright seized by younger Saturn, from he might here drove, his own and Rhea's son, like the measure found, so Jove your serpent reigned, these first in Crete, and Ida known, since on the snowy top of cold Olympus ruled the middle air, their highest heaven, or on the Delphian sea, or in Dodona, and through all of the bounds of Doric land, or who with Saturn old, fled over Adria to the Hesperian fields, and o'er the Celtic Rome the utmost isles. All these and more came flocking, but with looks downcast and damp, 
yet such wherein appeared obscure some glimpse of joy for having found their chief not in despair to have found themselves not lost in loss itself which on his countenance cast like doubtful hue but he his wanted pride soon recollecting with high words that bore semblance of worth not substance gently raised their fainting courage and dispelled their fears then straight commands that at the warlike sound of trumpets loud and clarions be upreared his mighty standard that proud honour claimed azazel as his right a cherub tall who forthwith from the glittering staff unfurled the imperial ensign which full of high advance shone like a meteor streaming to the wind with gems and golden lustre rich and blazed seraphic arms and trophies all the while sonorous metal blowing martial sounds at which the universal host upsent a shout that tore the hell's concave and beyond frightened the reign of chaos and old night all in a moment through the gloom were seen ten thousand banners rise into the air with orient colours waving with them rose a forest huge of spears and thronging helms appeared in serried shields and thick array of death immeasurable anon they moved in perfect phalanx to the dorian mood of flutes and soft recorders such as raised to height of noblest temper heroes old arming to battle and instead of rage deliberate valour breathed firm and unmoved with dread of death to flight or foul retreat not wanting power to mitigate and swage with solemn touches troubled thoughts and chase anguish and doubt and fear and sorrow and pain from mortal or immortal minds lest they breathing united force with fixed thoughts moved on in silence to soft pipes that charm their painful steps o'er the burning soil advance in view they stand a horrid from or dreadful length in dazzling arms and guise of warriors old with orders spear and shield awaiting what command their mighty chief had to impose he through the armed files darts his experienced eye and soon traverse the whole battalion views their order due their visages and stature as of gods their number last he sums and now his heart descends with pride and hardening in his strength glories for never since created man met such embodied force as named with these could merit more than that small infantry warred on by cranes through all the giant brood of phlegra and the heroic race were joined that fought at thebes and ilium on each side mixed with auxiliary gods and what resounds in fable or romance of uther's sons begirt with british and armoric knights and all who since baptized or infidel jousted in espramont or montalban damasco or morocco or trebizond or whom Baserta sent from Afric's shores when charlemagne with all his peerage fell by fontera thus far these beyond compare of mortal prowess yet observe their dread commander he above the rest in shape and gesture proudly eminent stood like a tower his form had yet not lost all its original brightness nor appeared less than archangel ruined and the excess of glory obscured as when the sun new risen looks through the horizontal misty air shorn of its beams or from behind the moon in dim eclipse disastrous twilight sheds on half the nations and with fear of change perplexes the monarchs darkened so yet shone above them all the archangel but his face deep scars of thunder had entrenched in care sat on his faded cheek but under brows of dauntless courage and considerate pride waiting revenge cruel his eye but cast signs of remorse and passion to behold the fellows of his crime the followers rather for other ones beheld in bliss condemned for ever now to have their lot in pain millions of spirits for his fault immersed of heaven and from eternal splendors flung for his revolt yet faithful how they stood their glory withered as when heaven's fire had scathed the forest oaks over mountain pines with singed top their stately growth though bare stands on the blasted heath he now prepared to speak whereat their doubled ranks they bend from wing to wing and half enclose him round with all his peers attend held him mute thrice he essayed and thrice in spite of scorn tears such as angels weep burst forth at last words interwove with sighs found out their way o myriads of immortal spirits o powers matchless but with the almighty and that strife was not inglorious though the event was dire 
as this place testifies, and this dire change hateful to utter, but what power of mind foreseen or presaging from the depth of knowledge past to present could have feared, how such united force of gods, how such has stood like these, could ever know repulse? For who can yet believe, though after loss, that all these poisoned legions, who exile hath emptied heaven, shall fail to reascend, self-raise, and repossess their native seat? For me, be witness all the host of heaven, if counsels different or dangers shunned, by me have lost our hopes. But he who reigns, monarch in heavens, till then as one secure, set on his throne, upheld by old repute, consent or custom, and his regal state, put forth at full, but still his strength concealed, which tempted our attempt and wrought our fall. Henceforth his might we know, and know our own, so as not either to provoke or dread new war provoked. Our better part remains, to work in close design, by fraud or guile, what force effected not, that he no less at length from us may find, who overcomes by force, hath overcome but half his foe, space may produce new worlds, whereof so rife there went a fame in heaven that he ere long intended to create, and therein plant, a generation whom his choice regard should favor equal to the sons of heaven, thither but to pry, should be perhaps our first eruption, thither or elsewhere, for this infernal pit shall never hold celestial spirits in bondage, nor the abyss long under darkness cover, but these wrought full counsel must mature. Peace is despaired, for who can think submission? War, then, war, open or understood, must be resolved. He spake, and to confirm his words, out flew millions of flaming swords, drawn from the thighs of mighty cherubim. The sudden blaze, far round illumined heaven, Highly they raged against the highest, and fierce with grasped arms clashed on their surrounding shields the din of war, hurling defiant toward the vault of heaven. There stood a hill not far, whose grisly top belched fire and rolling smoke, the rest entire shone with a glossy scurf, undoubted sign that in his womb was hid metallic ore, the work of sulphur. Thither, winged with speed, a numerous brigade hastened, as when bands of pioneers with spade and pickaxe armed forerun the royal camp to trench a field or cast a rampart. Mammon led them on, Mammon, the least directed spirit that fell from heaven, for e'en in heaven his look and thoughts were always downward bent, admiring more the riches of heaven's pavement, trodden gold, than aught divine or holy else enjoyed in vision beatific. By him first men, also, and by his suggestion taught, ransacked the center, and with impious hands rifled the bowels of their mother earth, for treasures better hid. Soon had his crew opened into the hill a spacious wound, and digged out ribs of gold. Let none admire that riches grow in hell, that soil may best deserve the precious bane, and here let those who boast in mortal things, and wondering tell of Babel, and the works of Memphian kings, learn how the greatest monuments of fame, in strength and art, are easily outdone by spirits reprobate, and in an hour, what in an age they, with incessant toil, and in hands innumerable, scarce perform, nigh on the plain, in many cells prepared, that underneath had veins of liquid fire, sluiced from the lake, a second multitude, with wondrous art, founded the massy ore, severing each kind, and scummed the bullion dross, a third is soon informed within the ground, of various mould, and from the boiling cells, by strange conveyance, filled with hollow nook, as in an organ, whom one blast of wind, to many a row of pipes and soundboard breathes, anon, out of the earth a fabric huge, rose like an exaltation, with the sound of dulcet symphonies, and voices sweet, built like a temple, where pilasters round were set, and Doric pillars overlaid, with golden architrave, nor did there want cornice or frieze, with bossy sculptures graven, the roof was fretted gold, not Babylon, nor great Alcaro such magnificence equaled in all their glories, to enshrine Belus or Serapis, their gods, or seat their kings when Egypt with Assyria strove in wealth and luxury. The ascending pile soon fixed her stately height, and straight the doors, opening their brazen folds, discover, wide, within, her ample spaces, o'er the smooth and level pavement, from the arched roof, 
pendant by subtle magic, many a row of starry lamps and blazing crescents fed with naphtha and asphaltus, yielded light as from a sky, the hasty multitude, admiring entered, and the work some praise, and some the architect, his hand was known, in heaven by many a tower structure high, with sceptred angels held their residence, and sat as princes whom the supreme king exalted to such power, and gave to rule, each in his hierarchy, the orders bright. Nor was his name unheard or unadorned in ancient Greece, and in the Asanian land men called him Molkabar, and how he fell from heaven they fabled, thrown by angry Jove, sheer o'er the crystal battlements, from morn to noon he fell, from noon to dewy eve, a summer's day, and with the setting sun dropped from the zenith like a falling star, on Lemnos, egg and isle. Thus they relate, erring, for he with this rebellious rout fell long before, nor aught availed him now to have built in heaven high towers, nor did he scape by all his engines, but was headlong sent with his industrious crew to build in hell. Meanwhile, the winged heralds, by command of sovereign power, with awful ceremony and trumpet sound, throughout the host proclaim a solemn council forthwith to be held at Pandemonium, the high capital of Satan and his peers, their summons called from every band and squared regiment, by place or choice the worthiest, they anon with hundreds and with thousands trooping came, attended, all access was thronged, the gates and porches wide, but chief the spacious halls, Though like a covered field their champions bold, Want ride and armed, and on the Saldan's chair, Defied the best of Panem chivalry, To mortal combat or career with lance, Thick swarmed both on the ground and in the air, Brushed with the hiss of rustling wings, As bees in springtime, when the sun with Taurus rides, Pour forth their populous youth from the hive, In clusters they among the fresh dews and flowers, Fly to and fro, or on the smooth plank, The suburb of their straw-built citadel, New rubbed with balm, expatiate and confer Their state affairs, so thick the airy crowd Swarmed and were straightened, till the signal given, Behold a wonder, they but now who seemed, In bigness to surpass earth's giant sons, Now less than smallest dwarfs in narrow room, Throng numberless like the Pygmean race, Beyond the Indian mount, or fairy elves, whose midnight revels by a forest side, or fountain some belated peasant sees, or dreams he sees, while overhead the moon sits arbitress and nearer to the earth, wheels her pale course, they on their mirth and dance intent, with jock and music charm his ear, at once with joy and fear his heart rebounds, thus in corporeal spirits to smallest forms, reduced their shapes immense, and were at large, though without number still, amidst the hall of that infernal court. But far within, and in their own dimensions, like themselves, the great seraphic lords, and cherubim, in closed recess, and secret conclave sat, a thousand demigods, on golden seats, frequent and full, after short silence then, and summons read, the great consult began.